The majority of Yemenis live in rural areas, but policy-oriented research and media reporting tends to focus on the situation in the current conflict in the major cities. It's a complex conflict environment in Yemen, with multiple domestic drivers creating unique conditions at the different local levels. And this is complicated by regional competition for real and perceived power projection between the Gulf states and Iran. Our workshop explored the need of Yemen's population, looking at the impact of the current fighting and changing market conditions on their livelihoods in urban and rural areas. Over 70% of the Yemeni population are living in rural areas. And some of these rural areas are still extremely isolated and hard to reach. You have very different levels of population density in different areas, but the main thing is that generally people in rural areas don't have access to most of what they need immediately. Yemenis are primarily dependent on, import, on imported staples. The fact that Yemen can't be self-sufficient in food now is due to the very rapid population growth that's taken place in the past 30 years or so. I mean, it has a population growth rate of about 3% per annum, which means a doubling of the population in 20 years and that basically its agroecology is not suitable for such a large uh, population. Most of the agriculture is still rain-fed. I mean, over 60% is rain-fed, and that's suffering enormously from climate change uh, side effects. The impact has been quite devastating, but it varies according uh, to area. By analyzing target, uh, data on targeting, from the Ministry of Agriculture and Irrigation and from the comp compilation of uh, social media uh, data done by the Yemen Data Project. It's possible to show that at least for the areas of Saada, Hajar and to some extent Hadeda and Sana'a, uh, there has been systematic targeting of agricultural fields, of animal production, of the transport and marketing systems and above all of the government institutions for agricultural uh, extension and development and research uh, throughout, right throughout the country. Jobs uh, in the private sector have almost uh, disappeared. Uh, all the big, uh, whatever we had in terms of uh, big uh, firms and companies have shut down. Um, it is almost impossible to get new jobs right now. All the different private sector uh, companies are no longer operating because of the situation. So that was one livelihood that was cut off. Um, and then we had, uh, for the poorest of the poor, for example, the social welfare payments have stopped uh, for over three years now because the government could no longer afford to make them. Um, so that uh, lifeline as well uh, was cut. Um, and then the uh, public sector uh, jobs and, and salaries were the last lifeline for many families for around um, 1.4 uh, public sector employees, 1.4 million public sector employees, uh, which basically translates to around 9 million uh, people in Yemen were dependent on public sector wages <clears throat> and that has also been uh, cut down uh, since uh, six months ago now. And so what we see is uh, basically a total collapse um, of the economy uh, from, from the livelihoods uh, perspective. Um, and we also see a collapse of the ability to uh, have any type of um, monetary policies by the central bank. Uh, there's a huge liquidity crisis. Uh, there's also a huge foreign exchange crisis. As the formal economy is, is collapsing, uh, what we are seeing is a, an increasingly a black markets uh, in all the different sectors. So we see it in the for, uh, currency exchange sector, we see it in the fuel supply sector, we see it all across uh, these black markets uh, emerging, um, a lot of smuggling uh, happening and, and all the people that control these new black markets are connected to the different conflict parties um, and share with them the wealth of these uh, black market operations that are happening. The impact uh, on civilians that we've observed in Thais is um, both very direct and violent and um, more indirect and related to the collapse of the health system. There are less doctors, they're not paid, uh, the hospitals don't have the supplies that they need, um, should it be the drugs or the fuel to, to, to run their operations. And um, and so we, we see in parallel the, 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 the increase in infectious diseases among the population and, um, and just simply people arriving 
too late to hospitals. We've been warning that famine may, may soon occur in Yemen. Um, we, we're not there yet, but unless the international community step up um, and actually help the situation, I mean, currently there's only 7% funding of the UN humanitarian appeal, which is um, really, really stark, given the sense that Yemen is a, the world's largest crisis today, and unlike in, in other contexts, um, the billions of dollars are just not arriving like they need to do. The uh, only way, way forward is uh, to start uh, negotiating with the local players um, uh, on the ground. The conflict started because of the collapse of the political process in 2014. That process needs to be revived. So going back to the transitional justice process, uh, reviving uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, referendum process, uh, and then eventually reaching to, uh, to, to, uh, to elections uh, uh, through, a, through, a, through a unity government. One of the clear themes that emerged from the workshop is that in this third year of the conflict, and while a political solution remains elusive, Yemen is fragmenting by default. And this issue of de facto decentralization will have to be addressed, if not formalized, in any final peace agreement.